Over the last year or so, Gamesr has been firing off these gamepads in this budget to entry level segment between $45 and $60, and it has gotten to the point where it's slightly confusing and the models are blending together with the feature sets. Which one should I get? The G7 is real similar to the G7 SE, and then you've got these two bad boys, the Cyclone and Cyclone Pro. What's professional about this one? Then you've got this one, then you've got that one. In this video, we're going to eradicate any confusion around these gamepads, and we're also going to give them a very in-depth, comprehensive review, part by part, component by component and find out if these are a good buy for you. Let's get it. This is your controller captain. We've reached 6,900 feet. Go ahead and start flicking the sticks and molly in the back paddles. Mm, you don't like back paddles? How about those rear buttons? We've, We've tested, tested almost 100 custom and premium controllers and we're only at the beginning. You need a thumbstick guide or a tutorial on how to overclock your controller? Check out the controller playlist. Bing bong. Controller captain out. A quick disclaimer for my audience, the stallions and stallionettes, these controllers were sent for review. However, this is going to be an honest, comprehensive review. I haven't been paid or told to say anything about them. So if there's any cons, shortcomings, or areas of improvement, you're going to hear about it, so these companies make better products over time. We're going to go down the back alleys of the global leading game peripheral brand, a game sir, a yes sir, let's do it. Top dead center, you're getting promoted for the gorgeous T4 Cyclone and Cyclone Pro, which are available for pre-order. Kevin, how the hell do you have them if they're just for pre-order? Because I'm a slick back pimp. Now, the differences between these two game pads are incredibly subtle, and the price difference is also quite minuscule or piquito as well. You got a $40 controller over here. Actually, I thought it was a $5 difference. $10 is a decent difference. I did find that interesting that there is only one color variant for each version. You can't get a white and black of the standard and a white and black of the pro. But if you hover over these controllers, they say the exact same thing. Multi-platform wireless gamepad, hull effect sticks and triggers. What the hell is the difference? Both of these units are using the exact same hull effect thumbstick modules, which are rated for 50 million clicks. What are they talking about with clicks? Actually clicking down L3 and R3, usually used for sprint and melee. They also have a really nice visual diagram over here, a little breakout of what their hull effect modules look like. You've also got a 0.1 millimeter squeeze on those triggers with a, a linear graph that they pulled on off the internet and put it on the website. Yep, it's smooth. You do have three modes of connectivity with this controller, which I do like. You have Bluetooth, USB-C, as well as a wireless dongle. However, it is sold separately on the entry level version. And they love to say multi-platform compatibility when it's really only for like one platform, Switch being the main platform here. Everything's going to work with PC because you can push drivers for damn near everything, a baked potato, your brother's pacemaker, whatever you might need, and then mobile over here. Well, yeah, if it's got a Bluetooth card, you can probably connect it to a phone or tablet quite effortlessly. That's expected. This does have six axis gyroscope motion aiming, which is important for those Switch games, and also PC players use it for clicking on faces as well. But right here, this is going to give you the breakout, the differences colorway. Yep, the, that's that's a visual difference there. But as far as the face or action buttons, you are going to have the Xbox layout on the Pro, and then this bad boy is going to have the Switch layout. That's not a huge difference whatsoever because you're probably not looking down at the controller to wonder what you're pressing, but this is a big difference, and that is how these face buttons are going to feel and perform. You have the micro switches, which are a digital tactile click on the Pro, and a more squishy mushy, but probably what you're used to, membrane switch in the regular John. Also to cut cost a little bit, there is no vibration motors in the triggers of the standard, and that dongle is included on the Pro, but a separately sold accessory on the standard. That's the differences. But at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about which GameSir controller I would recommend over all of them. The G7 SE, is it this one, that one, uh, you know, don't, don't you skip ahead. Don't you dare do it. Just be patient. The sugar is going to get glazed on you when it's ready. And over here on the landing page for the Pro version, they have a couple more features to flex, including those mecha tactile buttons, those mechanical switches, which are rated for 5 million clicks, which is decent. I would say most mechanical switches are rated for 8 to 10 million clicks if they do have a rating period, so it is nice that these do have one. As far as actuating distance, it's a little over half a millimeter, which is um, more than I expected. And there is your actuation force, so whether these feel like they have a lot of resistance or they're very light for you. The Pro version, as we covered earlier in that little diagram, does have additional vibration motors for the triggers, which you can disable or control the strength of in the application. As for the packaging and included accessories, that $10 difference doesn't really mean much as these are eerily similar. You're going to have these perforated cutouts saying a yes sir, a game sir, and also telling you to pull to unbox. This is kind of hard to do one handed, but it is very satisfying. Your box just like peels apart for you like a lotus flower just presenting itself to you. Little plastic bag on both game pads. One thing I really do like, you have a little small foam block in the top to keep that bad boy from rattling around in its transport to you. Games are definitely cut costs with the USB-C cables. These are just rubber, not microfiber braided, no dust covers, no Velcro tie backs, and these are hella short. You're probably only going to use these for charging. If you are a wired player that likes to, well, go wired, you're going to probably want to bring your own cable, which luckily you can do is these aren't permanently affixed. They're not proprietary or special, just standard 
USB-C cables. This little guitar pick looking joint is a quality control approval. Uh, yes, we looked at the son of a gun. It's not gonna break on you. Little holographic sticker because it's not a premium or pro controller unless this is in the box. Is that their current slogan or catchphrase? Just in game? And we can do better than that, guys. Come on now. Game, sir. Tally whack the competition. You're gonna see a slew of Chinese characters, a little bit of English top dead center, and a couple of QR codes, as well as contact if you're having issues, and plug for the social media in case you want to give them some free praise. The instruction manual is identical to current game sir models, which I'm not a fan of. It opens up like a massive booklet and has a bajillion languages. But this is kind of cool that you can do this. It's like an accordion, so this has gotta count for something. The only difference in include accessories is going to be that the pro version does come with the dongle. Fantastic. However, since it doesn't have a carrying case, this is just loose nilly willy and could get lost. If you're like me and have a billion of these dongles or transmitters sitting around, you shouldn't get confused with this one because it does actually have some branding on it. Game, sir. Thank the Lord. And then it does also have a button over here, which I'm assuming is for pairing. Wow, that's loud. Super quick note, despite the fact that these controllers are pretty much identical, GameStar actually did take the extra mile to make sure that there are two separate instruction manuals, one for the Cyclone and one for the Pro, despite the fact the contents, the words are almost identical, but they did actually brand them differently. As for the cosmetics or appearance, these both look like pretty good game pads, especially in the price point. The plastics don't look or feel super cheap, and I do like that little silver D-pad. It's not metal, it is plastic, just painted that brushed silver, but it does look very good. Also, I like the fact they went with light gray gray on the thumbstick caps, as well as the lettering on the face buttons. And I really genuinely like the stippling that wraps all the way around the side. Not only does it feel good, but it also adds a little cosmetic pop or flare. 37 pieces of flare on today. I'm gonna give these an eight out of 10. Eight out of 10 for both of them. As for the ergonomics or comfort, I had to get up close on these bad boys to confirm something with myself and then to show you exactly what I'm talking about. This is the G7 and G7 SE, and this is the new Cyclone and Cyclone Pro. Gamesir went with a different shell design. I understand why they did this. The G7 can be a little bit uncomfortable if you have medium to larger size hands. However, I think it is freakishly comfortable. In fact, a little bit more than the Cyclone and Cyclone Pro, which are more indicative or representative of a stock Xbox controller as where the G7, in my opinion, is a little bit more of the Switch Pro controller and a little bit less of the Xbox One controller. That's because these palm grips are cut in a lot more and also just thinner, meaning if you have smaller hands, this is just easier to wrap your hands around. One of the big complaints that GameSir was hearing is that for the medium and larger hands, this wasn't necessarily a comfortable gamepad, so that is where this new shell design comes into play. By no means is it bad. Out of all these controllers, I will say the G7 standard is the most comfortable with those rubber grips and these more aggressive cut-ins in the back. Also, you can really see a difference from this angle. It's more rounded, which I think is a more natural way that your hand wants to grip the palm grips, and it's a literal flat drop-off or cut-in right here on the Cyclone and Cyclone Pro, which doesn't feel as comfortable IMO or in my personal opinion. I think their older version, the G7, seven is more comfortable, but not by much. They're both super comfortable. I'd give this like a 9 out of 10 and this a 7.5 out of 10. As far as the percepted build quality, none of the components look or feel like they're very confidence inducing. For example, the rear buttons sound like this. And the controller feels like you have literally nothing in your hand. Very, very light. And everything you press just feels like a standard Xbox controller. The only exception to that would be the mechanical face buttons on the Pro controller. Well, I don't think there's an imminent explosion of this controller in your future. If you do have any broken parts, you have six T6 screws in the back, which will allow you to separate the front and rear and get at the internals. But if that's not for you, all GameSir controllers do have one year of standardized coverage in North America. I deeply despise the D-pad or direction buttons on both of these game pads. They are identical and they feel atrocious. They feel so disconnected connected from your inputs because you have one of those half dome d-pads similar to what you see with 8-bit dough but instead of having a sweet little pivot point you have quite the opposite and a lot of times it just doesn't feel secure when you're pressing it also roll-offs are virtually impossible also diagonal inputs not great the only redeeming factor is cosmetically i think this looks pretty good with that brush silver although this is already starting to wear off it's already starting to become black just after a few days of using the d-pad very small little imperfection in the paint but over the next couple months i'm sure that'll fade off off even more. The way they feel, the way they sound, everything about the D-pad is just unsatisfactory. But as far as the face or action buttons, the Pro does have those mechanical buttons which are rated for 5 million clicks, do have quite a bit further of an actuation. And of all the mechanical buttons that I have tested, these are probably my least favorite. They just feel a little bit hollow and tinny, also too light. And as far as size and spacing, I'm sure it's identical to an Xbox One controller, but it definitely feels more cramped and the buttons feel closer together. I got these skinny little meat hammers and I can easily cover all four of the face or action buttons with my thumb, which you can do with most game pads, but it's just so effortless to just engulf the whole side of the controller with your thumb. Ooh, but those are substantially 
worse. <laughs> These mechanicals aren't great, but the membrane switches are worse. They're louder. I'm gonna give the D-pad a two out of 10 and the face or action buttons a four out of 10 on the standard and a five out of 10 on the pro. Those are pretty subpar values, game sir. Those are not exemplary marks. As far as the accessory button suites, so that's gonna be this pause, select button, the share button, the mode switch button, and the a game sir, a yes sir button over here, which is pretty sick because it does illuminate green and red on both of these controllers. I'm not a huge fan of these buttons for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're pretty small. They are far enough from the front shell to where you can easily hit them, but this one is in a silly spot to where if you have an extended thumbstick cap on the left, which you might very well want to have a mid-rise, shit, even a high-rise. Maybe you're playing racing games and whatnot. You have to reach over in a weird way, kind of cock your thumb over in order to hit the select button over here. Also, all of the accessory buttons sound different. I understand it's kind of hard to sync up or unify all those buttons considering their different shapes and sizes. However, there are other game pads that all the buttons feel pretty similar. It's going to be a four out of 10 for me in the accessory button suite. But as far as these thumbsticks, analog sticks, joysticks, front niblets, diblets, it's got to be a redeeming factor. It's got to really boost your opinion of this controller because they're Hall Effect joints, right? Yes, that is true. And we're going to test them in Gamepad Tester. They, they, they do quite well for themselves. However, physically, there is no anti-friction ring. So you are scraping along some pretty rough plastic on the front shell when you're at full lock on the outside of your thumbstick gates. Quite a crazy crazy oversight, especially on the pro version over here, considering the G7 and G7 SE have anti-friction rings on them. Same price as this controller. Also, there's no consistency to the sound and feel clicking down the left and right analog sticks. They sound and feel different on both controllers and both sticks. The left and right analog stick clicking in should never sound different considering these are the identical modules in there. That's super weird. Also, these are freakishly short, pretty expected from a standard controller, but these are hella short. And as far as Control Freak thumbstick cap add-ons, what's the compatibility looking like for those? We're gonna start with the PS4 and 5 White Galaxies. Little bit of a challenge to get on, but they do fit perfectly. Got some red Infernos for the Nintendo Switch Pro controller. Pretty good, it's a little crooked on there, but it, it, it works, it'll get the job done. Then these little droppings from the gods are black Omnis for the Xbox One and Series controller. Oh golly, you can't force them on. I mean, I guess you could if you're super aggressive and don't mind breaking your shit, but I'm not that guy. Th they don't work. They're too taut. So you're going to be going with the PlayStation or Nintendo versions. Going wired in Gamepad Tester with the non-pro version. I immediately like what I see with a perfect resting value of 0.00002. As I move these analog sticks on their vertical and horizontal axis and then I stop, they always snap back to that default resting value. Also freakishly responsive. A lot of times with these Hall Effect thumbstick modules, if they they aren't calibrated correctly. They have a very large dead zone, which they don't need because they can't get stick drift other than that recentering spring, which we've talked about. But these modules do not suffer from that syndrome. They have definitely been calibrated properly and they are hell of responsive. How about that accuracy? How about that circularity? Exactly what I expected, under one percentile. These are freak beasts. I expect nothing less from the pro version. In fact, I'd expect a little bit more considering it's a $10 more expensive controller. However, that's not gonna be the case as these have identical thumbstick modules. Bam, there's that. Yeah, these are identical and they're supreme. As for the bumpers and triggers, you do have a smooth portion which is covered by the majority of your finger. That little rib stippling for grip actually isn't covered by your finger when you're touching the bumpers or covering them. You can press them on the sides as well as the top and you're still going to get them actuated, so that's pretty cool. The triggers, I'm not a huge fan of as they are incredibly light. It feels like you have zero resistance. There is no trigger lock or stop system and these are just freakishly light, so I'm going to give the bumpers a 5 out of 10 and I'm going to give the triggers a 3 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Rebinding these rear buttons on the fly can happen and that's fantastic. You don't need some software application or program, which does exist, but you don't need it to rebind these rear buttons. You can do it on the fly. A little bit more complicated and tedious than it needs to be with an extra step involved. The reason for that being these buttons do support up to 16 input macros. So if you want to be able to schwack one of these buttons and you're building a whole structure in Fortnite, you can do that with the magic of macros. Don't use it in online multiplayer, you sleazeball, or else I have no respect for you. But maybe a offline story-driven repetitive game, maybe you're farming for resources sources or something, you just hit that button and you know, get to work. But in order to bind these rear buttons, first of all, controller has to be on, paired up to either the PC or console. Then you're going to hold down this M button and one of these rear buttons, L4 or R4. That's what they call them. So we're going to hold down R4 over here. The status light will begin to flash rapidly to let you know you are in pairing mode. At this point in time, go ahead and start rattling off whatever face button, D-pad you want associated with those rear buttons. I just want one bound to them. I don't need any crazy macros or anything like that. I'm a traditionalist. So I'll just take A over here and bind that to this bad boy and B, 
that'll be over here for me. Now, instead of just being able to hold down A and this button and have it bound, it doesn't work like that since there is macro support. You're gonna press all the buttons you want. So in this case, just one button for me, press A, and then press the rear button that you want bound again. So hold down mode and the rear button that you want to bind, then press the button you want bound. So A, then press that rear button again. It's a little more complicated than it has to be, but since this has macro button support, that's how it's gotta be. Now for cost cutting measures, both of these rear buttons are the same in both the pro and standard version. And they are pretty damn good. You have these two large buttons, which are in a great ergonomic position where you want to naturally rest your hands. Your middle fingers are covering these. I will say they're just a skosh louder than I'd like. They're by no means as loud as aim and hyper, but these aren't by any means quiet. The mechanical face buttons are definitely quieter. It is a little interesting. They didn't go with any grip or stippling on here. Maybe a little dot pattern or lines or rubber or anything like that. It's just smooth plastic, which isn't a huge deal because you're not slip sliding off of these, but it's not the most satisfying thing on your fingertips. These rear buttons feel good, but not as comfortable as the G7 and G7 SE because they have those more round and slightly smaller palm grips, but these aren't bad by any means. I like the fact you can bind them on the fly despite the fact it's a little bit of a process. I'm gonna go ahead and give them a seven out of 10, a seven out of 10. Now I have a sad story to tell you if we all gather around the controller campfire as it's popping and crackling, I have something kind of depressing to tell you and that is the fact that you cannot use the PC software program, the GameSir Nexus, which is actually really good with this gamepad. At least not yet, there is absolutely zero compatibility for it. It says game sir device not detected. However, I can actually control the application, change the language with the controller. So it knows the controller's connected, but there's no compatibility for this model. So what do we do? You have to scan the QR code in the instruction manual and that will take you to a phone application. Gross. I just talked about why phone applications to control controllers is not the way because your controller is completely useless while it's Bluetooth to your phone, making those tweaks. And it's just another third party application that collects data on your phone and the user interface of navigating on a mobile phone is never as smooth and as customizable and in-depth as a PC or console program. Having said that, this is all we have currently. So the PC program has 3.2 stars from 18 ratings, which I think is very low. I'd give it about a 4.5 out of 5. I think it's a great program in comparison to other controller software suites. The mobile version that we're installing here today, if you can just go ahead and zoom in on that, but the mobile version has 2.7 stars. I love how detailed that update is. Fix some known issues. Cool. I'm installing it. It's immediately going to ask you for Bluetooth access because that's how you're going to con control your controller. Then with the controller off, you're going to hold down the home button and Y for a few seconds until it goes into pairing mode, which you'll see from a rapid flash. It's going to let me know there is a firmware update available and I am immediately going to do that. Some more of that unnecessary jank of using a mobile phone application as opposed to PC or console. If you do anything with your phone and do not leave this running on the front end, then this is going to fuck up your controller. Also, it's a slow moving update as well. That's another thing. What, uh, it's a cell phone. What if I need to do phone shit, like text messages and take calls? Not while this is installing. All controller companies watching this video, this is AK40 Kevin, AKA the controller captain. Please move well far and vast away from using cell phone applications to control your game pads. Cause it's stupid, it's silly, it's inconvenient, it's slow and, and it's dumb. <laughs> That's uh, another thing. It said it successfully completed the update, but I strongly doubt it because the controller turned itself off. So uh, did it complete the update? We're going to find out. So I was having a hell of a time reconnecting to the controller after the update, and I was just getting ready to burn down my house and you know have a mental breakdown. But none of that's necessary because all you need to do is change the input mode by holding down the home button and each one of these four face buttons. It is going to throw it into a different input mode. Things like D input, X input and Bluetooth discoverable, which does which but you're going to have to consult the instruction manual for that. Now, the only controller customization is going to be in the configure tab, which automatically pops your phone into landscape. And I'm going to screen record and overlay it so you can see what the hell I'm doing here. But you can switch between the Xbox or switch face button layouts. You can remap the two rear buttons. You can toggle on and off a low battery indicator. You can select the minimum and maximum input for both the thumbsticks. And you see these dots, you think maybe you'll get a visual representation like gamepad tester, but it's not. If you move the thumbsticks, nothing happens. I would recommend moving the default from five to zero because this will tighten up your dead zones. You have the minimum and maximum squeeze for the triggers. And you do have full control of the four vibration motors, two on the standard, four in the pro version. So you probably noticed one of the major features that is missing versus the GameSir Nexus application for PC is there's no selection for the polling rate. That's something that you can do is crank the polling rate all the way to a thousand with the GameSir G7 and G7 SE, giving you under one millisecond of input lag or delay. That is not an option here. You cannot select it. You still can manually overclock using a third party program called the Lord of Mice, which we're going to do in this video, but that's kind of disappointing that that features on the G7 and not 
out the cyclones. Just the whole fact you have to use a phone application versus a much more in-depth, easy to use and feature rich PC application is frustrating. As for battery life, both controllers in the cyclone series are equipped with an 860 milliamp hour battery, which can get you up to 30 hours of gameplay. And I can find zero information about the charge time. I haven't been able to kill the battery yet. I'm assuming it doesn't have fast charging. Getting our stock input lagger delay going wired on the pro version, we're going to see about two milliseconds of input lagger delay. Kevin, why are you going to say two when I see eight down there? That's because there's a major outlier, which is one large number. It's going to throw off our average right there. I ain't lying to you. But if you scroll through the numbers manually, you're going to see pretty much everything is on the threshold of two milliseconds of input lagger delay on a 500 hertz stock clock. But I will run one more just to confirm that amongst the gang here. Gang, gang, or just simply don't bang. Gang, gang. Snap, crackle, pop. Snap, crackle, pop. Hadouken. Snap, crackle, pop. Mmm, ice cream so good. Balloon. Yeah, 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 Two milliseconds of input lagger delay on a 500 hertz stock clock while wired. How about the Walter White version over here? Say my name. It's gonna be the same thing. Interesting. It is the same exact thing. If you scroll through the numbers, it is identical, but it looks so much better down here in the average at 1.8 milliseconds, despite the fact we have 13 outliers, which are numbers that don't agree with the rest of the stats. Let's run a couple more. Both of these controllers are at two milliseconds on a 500 hertz stock clock, and also quite consistent as the minimum and maximum are relatively close, and the jitter also isn't freakishly high either. How about that dongle? Now, in order to go wireless on the PC, you have an extra option with the Pro as you do have that dongle, but you can pop for the dongle separately, but but if you just want to go wireless out of the box, I do like that it's color coded on the home button, depending on what mode you're in, as there is four different modes, X input, D input, Bluetooth, dongle, etc. However, I do not like the fact that it doesn't just automatically pair up. So if you're in Bluetooth mode and then you plug in that dongle, you think it would just snap to using the most fast and consistent connection being that dongle. You have to manually exit Bluetooth mode by holding down the home button and X to put it back into dongle connection. Uh, not bad. We're getting about five milliseconds via Bluetooth. Let's roll well, it's all over the road though, not consistent. Let's run another one, shall we? 4.3 on that one. Ew. It's like GameStar didn't skimp on that Bluetooth card. We ain't got no 3.0 in here. It's probably 5.0. Shit. Pretty consistently getting between four and six milliseconds of input lagger delay going Bluetooth. As expected, not very consistent though. Is the minimum and maximum hella far from each other and the jitter is up the ass. How about the dongle? So a relatively unpleasurable set of circumstances is you have to pick and choose. Do you want a fast wireless connection or a consistent wireless connection? As usually a dongle will offer you both, but you're not getting that here. As with the dongle, you're seeing these major outliers pop up every here and then. That that one wasn't even mentioned because guess what? It's not an outlier. These three are down here, but you're seeing these huge 15s that pop up pretty frequently. There's a big one. There's a big one. There's a big one, which are some little spikes that will be felt in gameplay. Pretty unfortunate. The Bluetooth connection was even more inconsistent. However, it was faster on peak or maximum speeds. So both of the wireless methods aren't ideal, and I most likely would be going wired with this controller, at least on the PC side of the house. But then we get to a little more fun, and that is the fact that these controllers are polling rate locked, whether you're going wired, wireless, and since the manufacturer doesn't offer any kind of a polling rate selection in the software, you're stuck at the speeds that I've shown you here today, which aren't fantastic. As for modes of connectivity, I have this massive pamphlet draped over the desk. This is just a huge instruction manual. English is only going to be this little left section right here. But of course, you can go wired on the PC with that USB-C cable. You can use the USB dongle, which is already prepared out of the factory. But if it has come unpaired for some reason, hold down this button while you're plugged in and do these not so simple steps to repair on your controller. If you're repping banner Steve Jobs, Jobs, you can pair via iPhone. If it's Lime Green for you, this has Android support as well. I guess Lime Green will also be Xbox or Nvidia, but in this case, we're talking about Android. And then the one console this controller is designed for, the Nintendo Switch. Most likely you're gonna be using the Bluetooth method, which is very easy. You're gonna go to change grip or order. And then it'd be cool if you could just press the home button and have it pair up, but you have to do a little trickery and hold down Y and the home button to put it into pairing mode. That is only for the initial pairing. However, after that, you will be able to wake up the console just by pressing the home button. Instead of a traditional cons, pros, and verdict section, I'm going to approach the sign off a little bit different. I honestly think games are shot themselves in the foot a little bit because I honestly think component by component, part by part, considering they are the identical price, the previous controllers from GameSir, the G7 and G7 SE are better than the Cyclone and Cyclone Pro, in my opinion. I'm 5'11 and have somewhat medium to larger size hands, and I think that the G7 is more comfortable. Comfort is completely subjective because everyone has different size and shaped hands. Well, they should be the same shape, but different size hands. This has a slightly less comfortable shell design, 
design, a much less usable D-pad, and the rear buttons feel the same, but are quite a bit louder than the previous version. And they removed anti-friction rings from the outside of the thumbstick gates, which is so funky. And last but not least, the G7 and G7 SE use the GameSir Nexus application, which allow you to select the polling rate. You don't even have to install some third-party overclocking software. You can just do it from the manufacturer's software. Just select that thousand hertz polling rate, and you're slapping noobs back to the lobby in COD. Under one millisecond of input lag or delay. Not so much here as you have a funky cell phone application, which is just a terrible implementation for any kind of app. When it comes to gamepads, PC or console, or binding on the fly directly from a controller with like a profile switch button or a little touchscreen or something other than <laughs> a phone application. And it sort of does beg the question, why do these controllers exist? It does kind of seem like Gamester is just trying to fill out their model lineup with so many controllers in the same price point. One thing the Cyclone and Cyclone Pro can do that previous Gamester gamepads cannot do is the fact that these are wireless. Granted, these are only for Switch and mobile platforms. However, with the wide world of converters or adapters, some of which are in the description below, you are able to use these controllers on Xbox Series S and X or to play PS4 games on your PS5. Navigate your console, but every time you launch a PS5 game, you'll get that little error message saying, hey buddy, use a DualSense. So that is one major difference over all previous GameSir controllers, and I wanted to cover that now in the verdict section because it adds another layer of value. Considering you can get this wireless controller with magnetic Hall Effect thumbsticks that should never get stick drift for you. Then you pick up a converter adapter, which is about 45, 50 bucks on Amazon. And keep in mind that converter or adapter will work for hundreds of controllers for you. So that one investment will work when you're done with this gamepad and you move on to the next thing. So because of that, I think these controllers are fantastic. They do offer a great value if you are going to pair them with a converter and be able to use them on a multitude of platforms. But even if you're just going to be using this on its dedicated console to switch, I do believe this offers a fantastic value. They're all linked in the description below. All the games or controllers which I have reviewed, those reviews and the controllers themselves are linked in the description below. And I'll see you stallions and stallionettes tomorrow. Peace. If you enjoyed the video, liking it helps it to get seen by more gamers. This information will reach and assist them as well, which in turn helps me grow this little channel, which I do greatly appreciate. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover news in the gaming community and industry, tutorials helping you get set up streaming and YouTubing, as well as honest gaming product reviews, keyboards, mice, headsets, controllers, mics, chairs, etc. There are some hefty exclusive discount codes found only in the description of my videos and only for the audience here at Gamer Heaven. I have links to all my other platforms and socials in the description below. To get in touch with myself and the stallions and stallionettes of gamer heaven join the community discord and check me out at twitch.tv where i go live every other leap year on a blue moon if it falls into an odd calendar number and my ph balance is on point just kidding starting june i'm going to be live streaming a lot thanks for watching this has been ak40 kevin hosting gamer heaven and i'll see you tomorrow because i upload daily all the time 60 percent of the time sometimes most of the time peace